All right. Hello. And I am here live with the incredible Mrs. Mara Davi. Hi, everyone. And hi, Sarah. Hi, Mara. It's so good so to see you. So good to see you. Let's see here. I'm going to hop on here so I can make sure I can see everybody's questions for you. Yay. That. Let's see here. All right. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for joining us and, and being here on our quarantine journey. Of we have a really busy schedule right now, so it was really <laughs> tough to squeeze in. <laughs> well, I'm glad you could, you know, find that time. Hop from... off hop off the couch from streaming, streaming yeah. TV shows. Yeah, I saw this meme was like, oh, what are you going to do for Mother's Day? It's like, oh, I don't know. Am I going to go on the living room couch? Am I going to go on the family room couch? I'm going to go to the kitchen table. I don't know. We'll, we'll get crazy. We'll, we'll visit them all. <laughs> go wild. Go wild. Yeah. Do a tour. Do a tour. That's, um, it just reminds me of my son. I have a two-year-old son and I'm still nursing him. And so he, but he like prefers different couches for nursing time. So it's like mama Jasper couch, mama white couch. Like they all, all the couches have names and he bosses me <laughs> which one to go to before nap time. Oh my gosh. He's so the boss of me. Yeah. I, I getcha. I get yeah. that. Yeah. Kids tend to take over. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so if anybody ever has any questions for Mara or anything, please feel free to shoot them down below. Otherwise, we're just going to keep chatting it up and catching up. Uh, Mara and I went to college at Cal State Fullerton out in California. And that's how we met. Now, what's funny, though, before that, you lived in Sacramento, correct? Right. And so we only lived 30 minutes from each other even before that because we were up in, I was up in Lodi, Stockton area. But it's just like far enough that you're not doing the same community theater circuit, things like that. I mean, even um, I've met girls doing shows here in New York and we live 15 minutes apart. But, you know, we went to like competing dance schools and did completely different theater and never got to perform together until we were in New York City. Yeah, that's crazy. Oh, my gosh. Um, so. Well, the last time we did a show together was a chorus line yes, it was. Fullerton, where you were Cassie and I was Maggie. Yes. And, oh my gosh. So much fun. And you then so a soon beautiful Maggie. You sang the oh, truth out of that. It was so good. Oh geez. Coming from you, that's yeah. It's true. Yeah. Hi Joey. <laughs> Hi, Brett. Ah, Joey Booze, Brett Mutter. Those are two guys that I met doing the um, Circa 21 Playhouse here in Rock Island. Yes. And they absolutely love you and your rendition of Maggie and your at the ballet clip. I think Joey played that for me several times. <laughs> yeah. Well, you um, need to see Miss Sarah do it and get her to pull out the DVD that we have from our college production. Oh, oh my gosh. I don't even know if I have that. I definitely, I definitely have it. I will pull it out. And I need a copy of See that. if I can digitize it somehow. Technology. <laughs> um, oh, good. So you can see the comments coming. Yeah, through. Can I can see what's coming through. Oh, yeah, 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 we're really learning about this. We're figuring it out. Yeah. I know. We've never. We both never used the Streamyard thing, so we're like figuring oh. it out. <laughs> So tell me about your journey from, I know you left Fullerton because you got the lead in 42nd Street tour, correct? Yes. And then tell me about that whole journey from there to making your way to Broadway. Sure. So I, I just feel really blessed. Like a lot of right place, right time kind of things happened. First of all, I was very focused on school. I was a sophomore in school, so I wasn't even really looking for outside work. We were in the middle of doing a chorus line and I was deep into it. But fortunately, my husband, Aaron, who was my boyfriend at the time, and our mutual friend, Megan Swanson, was her mm -hmm. name at the time, they both came up to me and they were like, Mara, did you see in backstage they're doing a tour of 42nd Street, which was my dream show, my dream role. So like even that right place, right time that my friends were looking out for me and saying, hey, you got, you got to audition for this. So um, we were going to school in Southern California. The tour auditioned in New York and California. So I got to audition in LA, which was actually helpful because their musical theater auditions are at, just have a smaller turnout. So I think mm -hmm. 
that there's more opportunity to be seen at those auditions. Obviously, like I still wanted to move to New York, live in New York because there is just a greater quantity of auditions there. But in terms of people turning out for the auditions, being in LA for a few of the auditions in my career, I think have has really helped me. So I toured with 42nd Street for a year. We went to Japan, which was amazing. Then we toured, it was a non, non-union tour, so we toured some of the smaller theaters across the country. And then um, I came back, I was planning on going back to Cal State Fullerton, but at the end of tour, we were touring through LA. And so again, I went to an open call for White Christmas, which was then playing in three different cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Boston. I auditioned in Los Angeles and I got a call back in New York, which worked out because the tour then went to New Jersey. So I just took the train in from New Jersey had that callback in New York City, and then ended up being in the ensemble in the uh, Boston company of White Christmas. Mm -hmm. I got my equity card that way and stayed away from school a little longer. And after (laughs) White Christmas, I was planning on going back to Cal State Fullerton to join you guys again. And Aaron and I just like had a mini New York vacation after White Christmas. Um, He stayed with me for a week and then I stayed an extra two weeks just to audition and see what it was like because I had auditioned for 42nd Street and White Christmas in LA. I had not had that New York experience. And I should also say through, after 42nd Street before White Christmas, when I was back in California, I ran into someone I had done local theater with and he said, I just signed with an agency. You should sign with them too. So again, like that, just kind of fell in my lap. And that is such a hard thing for so many people, just getting that agent. And this friend Mm -hmm. was so generous and so kind to say, you should do this. I met with the agency and since I had just come off playing the lead in this tour and had just booked an equity role, I didn't really have to audition for them. They just said, come, come join. So I was in New York for these three weeks auditioning And the New York office of this agency, they were like, well, we're not really bi-coastal. You have to audition for us, but we will submit you for this one thing. They're they're having a really hard time finding Maggie in a chorus line. Can you sing it? And I was like, that is my dream role. I have been singing at the ballet in my shower since I first heard this cast album when I was 11 years old. So please send me in for that. Um, And I went in for an agent call for that. I think there were like 30 girls maybe. We had to dance two at a time in front of the cameras because they were making the Every Little Step documentary. And um, okay. and my dancing wasn't great. So they came out and they were like, your singing was great, but your turns have to be sharper and your leaps have to be higher. So, and the callback was in a week. And I was like, I'm not gonna learn how to be a great <laughs> dancer in a week. But he hooked me up with, Tice Diorio of So You Think You Can Dance Fame. He was was also called back. He's in the documentary. You can see his audition. Um, And he was with my agency. So they hooked us up. I paid him for an hour to just kind of give me some tips to sharpen up my dancing. And I guess it was enough. I guess so. Because I got the job and I got to be in the revival of a chorus line for a full year, which was amazing. That is amazing. I think I remember you story when you found out you were just sitting in the park, right? In New York or something when you found out you got the role. Yes, I was, it was my last. So my callback was on a Monday and I was flying home on a Wednesday, flying back to California to go back to school. And on Tuesday, I was just sitting in Central Park eating a tasty delight because that was super (laughs) popular at the time from Sex in the City. And I got the call from this agency and they were like, you have to come to our office right now. They wouldn't tell me why, but I was like, I don't, I think this is good news because otherwise, why would they be presenting it this way? And lo and behold, their office was literally a block away from where I was sitting in Central Park. So I went to the office and they told me, and I called my parents while I was in their office. And I called Aaron, my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time. 
And um, yeah, then I just walked down Broadway and did some bell kicks going down the street. I was, <laughs> As you should. <laughs> yeah, I just had this like moment of like ownership of feeling a part of it. And I just wanted to like um, dance down the street. That, that so, must have been just an incredible feeling. It, it was amazing. You know, that, that initial feeling was amazing. And then that was January 21st, I think. Or no, it was right after my birthday. So it was like January 23rd or 24th. And and we didn't start rehearsals till June 7th. Oh my gosh. So then for the next six months, I was like reading everything about A Chorus Line, the original production, how people were just like fired all the time. And oh, I, I like made myself crazy. I was, I, bet. I put myself through my own school. I moved to New York early. I moved in March thinking like it would be great to get the lay of the land. And it was, but at the same time, I would, I like moved there all alone and didn't have rehearsal, didn't have a job. So I was just like by myself every day, freaking out, thinking I'm going to be fired. The minute that I start rehearsals, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not a good enough dancer. Like I'm not a good enough singer. I am going to get fired. So that was like six months of not full out panic attacks, but definite like neuroses and craziness leading up to it. I bet. I bet you, you work so hard to attain that achievable. And then you just, Oh, don't, don't let anything happen to mess yeah. it up, please. Yeah. <laughs> and that happens with every job. I get there's like the beginning celebration and then stupid imposter syndrome sets in and you go, Oh my God, they're gonna uh, figure that. me out. They're gonna find out. And I think yeah. a lot of people have stupid imposter syndrome and I like <laughs> try to talk myself out of it, but um it's really hard to do. It that. is. It is. It happens to all of us, no matter where you're performing, what you're doing. I feel like that insecurity always can kind of try to creep its way in and you just got to work to get it out of there. Yeah. You get it out there or you just say like, oh, I know you old friend. Yes. Been here before. Exactly. You're going to be here again. Yeah. So I'm just going to like know you're going to be there and just do this anyway because it worked out last time. Yeah. So well, we're going to get of, Speaking of fear, um, you to this day are still one of the most fearless auditionees I've ever seen that you are such an amazing auditioner. And that's so important in this business to be good at auditioning. So what is what are your tips for people out there that, um, you know, auditioning, whether it's in New York or wherever, um, what do you do to either stay so calm and rock mm -hmm. it or mm -hmm. really be good at hiding? <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely... There's definitely a lot of hiding. I guess it depends on what I'm auditioning for and how comfortable I feel going it in, going into it. So I'd say preparation is key because preparation leads to ownership. I'd say I am more afraid at auditions when I don't feel like I own the material yet, don't feel like it's in my body and that I've made it my own. So um, Aaron is my coach at home and I've got some wonderful coaches in New York City as well. Rob McCaskill is one of my favorite coaches in New York City. And then I've got Aaron to rehearse with me at home and half of it is coaching. I love coaching. I love getting feedback yeah. from someone else because um, it's collaboration. Art is better as a collaboration. We can't see what we're doing from the outside. We're storytelling and we need someone else to tell us if the story is landing or not and how to do little tweaks to make the story better. Mm -hmm. um, so coaching is great. And the other part of coaching is it's just rehearsal. So even if someone didn't give you any tips at all, didn't adjust you at all, just the repetition of doing it over and over again leads to ownership. And I think ownership is key. Um, there's still that, you know, you get in the audition waiting room and you see everyone else and you might feel that like, oh, everyone else looks like they could play this role better than me. They look more this character than I do, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you've got to like <laughs> get over that. But I feel like the more ownership that I feel, the more prepared I feel, then I feel like I am this character. Mm -hmm. They might be too, but I totally am this person. 
Um, and then I just always like to think that even if, even if I don't get this job for the 60 seconds or five minutes or 10 minutes that I'm in that room, that is the show. That is the job. So all of the preparation is worth it because I get to do the show. There might only be one person sitting behind that table that gets to see it. But for those 60 seconds, I am Sally Bowles. I am awesome. this lawyer on this TV show. Um, so, then, so then you can feel victorious at the end of the day because you played that role. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely love that. Um, let's see. Oh, Brett Mutter says he saw you in Dames at Sea Revival and you lived. Thank you, Brett. <laughs> and him, actually, him and Joey are just moved to New York. So oh, great. oh to, just in time, time, you guys. Yeah. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Great time. Getting really comfortable in your new home. <laughs> oh, what a relief. Yes. Um, so another big part of your life is the Broadway Green Alliance yeah. and your collaboration. So tell us a little bit about all of that. Sure. Um, so the Broadway Green Alliance is an incredible uh, organization under the umbrella. Thank you, Brian Vestal. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the Broadway Green Alliance is under the umbrella of Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, and their mission starts with the greening of Broadway theaters, and then it, we have expanded out to off-Broadway, touring, regional. We um, might not have an official presence within regional theaters, but Broadway Green Alliance hopes to be a resource for support for regional theaters. So if the Spotlight Theater wants to green their practices, they yeah. they can go to the Broadway Green Alliance website or reach out and receive um, materials, lists, checklists, ideas, support in that way for ways to green your theater. Um, but we are expanding all the time, expanding our network to hopefully, our goal is within the next 10 years to incorporate all the theaters of America within this umbrella of greening theater for what we're calling climate positivity. Not we're calling like the green movement is calling climate positivity. So it's more than just being carbon neutral. It's about being climate positive and not just staying, trying to stay at the level of carbon we are now, but actually reverse the cycle. Um, I have, been passionate about taking green steps in my own life. And so joining the Broadway Green Alliance felt like the natural step to um, be a part of it in, in my theater community. And um, yeah. yeah, so so go to that website that's on the screen. Yes, out. right there, um, down below. And you can use the practices to contribute to whatever theater you're involved in or whatever office you're involved in. It just like the steps that they have, they've been working with the NRDC to put together a really great advisor for all the steps, whatever workplace or home life you're in to um, make it a greener place. Yeah. And it will make a big difference because I know even just one theater, how much paper we go through, even with like programs and you have to order, you know, as much as you think you'll need, but you need to order a little bit more in case, you know, you have all these walk-ups and things like that. So you end up with all these extra programs. So we've started doing, we put out asking people to recycle their program, to leave it there, you know, especially if they don't think they're going to take it home and, and keep it as a keepsake, leave it at the theater. So that way we can recycle them and use them for other audience members and stuff. So it's so great. And the program is honestly like the biggest, one of the biggest um, challenges we've been facing sure. um, at the Broadway Green Alliance because people love their playbills, you know, and, right. um, and they do create a lot of trash and a lot of waste and um, they can't be reused at the theater because you don't know what some, you know, yeah, some, some now people, how we might not be able to do that anymore. <laughs> right, exactly. And you know. like people put gum in them and things like that. So they can't get reused. Hopefully they're yeah. being recycled. Um, but, you know, like in London, you pay if you want a program. Um, but that's just common practice there. So people are used to it. And sure. off, off Broadway, 
And in other theater situations, they're going digital and having digital programs where you just get like a skinny, skinny sheet of paper and then you can scan the QR and okay. see the whole bio online. Um, but apparently it's our union, apparently Actors' Equity like requires that all of our names and bios be printed, you know, a certain size, like that we get our bio of glory. Gotcha. So it's actually something that we mm -hmm. as actors have to agree that we would be okay having our um, name put out there in a different way digitally. Like we have to go, um, go to our union and allow it to happen. It's not something that the BGA can enforce. Like we as actors have to say, hey, we want to be greener and we don't mind being publicized in a different way. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. It really, it makes such a difference. Each of us doing our part. And I know you just wrote an ebook for how you can become thinking about becoming more green while we're in this quarantine right I now. Did, I did. So I've been, my husband and I have been aiming for zero waste. We know we'll never be zero waste, but less waste. Um, and and so I just decided to put together a book of ideas of how, while we might have extra time on our hands and we're stuck at home, little things that we can do to decrease our waste and put different habits in practice. And I've got a link to it on my Instagram at Mara Davi. Um, just, it's a short PDF. It's like 19 pages with great resources at the end of like all of my favorite green, uh, products and sure. blogs and all of that. And you guys have a webinar series coming up next week at broadwaygreen.com too, right? I forgot to ask about that a little bit ago. Yeah. Um, the webinars have been going on for, we are in our second week now. So I just oh, okay. my webinar yesterday um, <laughs> and the, and there's a replay of it on Broadway Green Alliance Facebook page. Um, mine was about ways to be zero waste during this time. Next week, Beth Malone, Tony winner Beth Malone Ooh. is going to be talking, I believe, about how they did, um, how they did plastic free production for Molly Brown, which they were in production of when quarantine happened and it had to shut mm -hmm. down for the time being. But anyway, I'm really interested to hear that like that. Yeah. I, I am too. huge to hear how a whole theatrical production could go plastic free. So, so that will be next Thursday at one. And also tomorrow Broadway green Alliance is hosting a crafting session. Our, um, one, a member of our steering committee, Sasha Pinsanti, she has a shop called some other me shop and she makes playbill flowers and they're stunning and she sells oh. them for broadway cares equity fights aids these playbill flowers so she will be teaching everyone how to make flowers out of any paper but then if you want to upcycle those playbills um oh, to there you go keep them at home but maybe oh, display them in a vase in a room such as the one sarah is in now um then she will be teaching that I think it's at 11 a.m. It might be at 10 a.m. So go to broadwaygreen.com slash green quarantine to find how you can learn about Playbill flowers. Yeah, that's a, such a neat way to to put your, in the, the usually your Playbills are probably sitting in a drawer or on a, maybe on a shelf, but turning it into a flower, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, Mr. Brent Tubbs has a I question. I know him. <laughs> um, he says, obviously, you don't know for sure, but with productions and theaters closing left and right on Broadway, what do you feel the state of Broadway will be in six months? That's a great question. And yeah, I don't have like, I don't have a bright answer for it. Um, it's really hard because Broadway in particular, all theater, but Broadway in particular relies on tourists and, and, um, oftentimes older people who have money. So like those two target audiences, um, I think are being hard hit right now. Obviously there's zero tourism. And unfortunately we are losing a lot of our beloved elders right now. So um, 
it's going to be, it's going to be hard to come back from, I think. Yeah. I, I, I honestly, like, I'm sure we all feel the same way. It's, it's, yeah. it's just almost impossible to visualize yeah. what it, what the comeback is going to look like. I can, there are things that I can like wish and hope for. Um, you know, the optimistic side of me wants this to be a reset, a, you right. know, that Broadway mm -hmm. ticket prices might be more affordable when we come back, that shows might choose to um, have more bare bones sets, not as spectacular, you know, like that it, yeah. my favorite phrase, I just keep saying this to everyone, necessity is the mother of invention. Right. So like if the necessity is that we just can't afford to put on big extravagant shows, like what creativity, what new things could come out. So that is my hope is that a bunch of beautiful new things come out that don't cost a lot of money that um, are filled with heart and not commercialism in mind. Absolutely. Because you can put on a beautiful production with just people. On right, stage. and I mean, like that might be what needs to happen. We just don't know how long we're gonna be here. And then we don't know, right? like even when we're set free from our homes, like when are we gonna feel good to be comfortable with it? Comfortable with 1500 people in a tight space. So yeah, it might just be a group of people out on a lawn doing theater, you know, who knows? <laughs> Um, no, I, I, I feel the same way. I mean, Brent and I talk about this on a daily basis. You know, we don't, we don't know what, what it's going to look like in, you know, when this April 30th lifts. So, you know, it's just so hard to say what anything yeah. will look like in, in two weeks, you know, let alone two months. So, yeah. Brian Vessel says, I was this close to seeing Jeremy Jordan in Little Shop. Tear. I know it was <laughs> devastating. All of the shows it is. we had on our list to see that hopefully we'll get to see later. I mean, I was dying to see the revival of Company. So many friends in that. And I have faith that these shows that were, you know, slated to be such hits, were so popular, had good advances. I really hope that they make it through this. Yeah, and, it's then just we'll a, and there's devastating things going on for everyone right now. It's so important that we all give each other love and grace because everybody is going through and losing out on incredible things that they've been working on or we're looking forward to. And yeah, you know, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Okay, let me see. Well, okay, let's talk about... Um, so at the, I'm going to go back to at the ballet. Just <laughs> Yeah. By the way, if all of you don't know, you can actually go watch the clip of Mara singing at the ballet, go to YouTube. Just all you have to search is Mara Davi at the ballet. It'll be right there. Yeah. Incredible. Um, she can belt higher than anybody I've ever known. So, <laughs> um, and then you can actually watch your audition too, that you got. And it's on the, the other night. I was like, oh my gosh. Look at yeah. So we've got the recording of the audition and then, and then 10 years, 10 years. Yeah. 10 years later, me singing it at the Hollywood bowl. Oh, to prepare. Yeah. oh my gosh. So how do you um, kind of two, I guess, questions right now, what are you doing to kind of stay in vocal shape right now while you're on this hiatus? And also, what do you do to, um, how do you belt that high? How do you get up there? What, what are your, what are some of the maybe tricks and tips you have for people out there? Sure. Okay. So how am I staying in vocal shape? Well, I'm probably not doing all that I could right now. I'm like, well, I don't have to work. So I'm just going to go play in the garden instead of like doing a vocal routine. Um, and I'm not usually that responsible about like vocal maintenance anyway. However, I am constantly singing to my son and I'm finding that while it might not be maintaining my Broadway belting vocal chops, it's opened up some nice thinner, lighter sounds, right? Like I, I've become a much better soprano <laughs> since, since my son was born because I can only sing light to him. So it's really opened up a freedom 
You don't want a bell at the ballet to him at, at bedtime? Oh my God. <laughs> he would be so pissed. Like <laughs> he like anytime I sing loud, he's two and he has opinions now. So he just gives me a total stank face. I think because like he wants to be the star now and he wants to sing. So he's like, Mom, it's my time to shine. You can sing light, but I'm the one that's gonna belt. <laughs> sure. Yep. <laughs> But when it comes to how do I, how how to sing that stuff, I really love thinking of belting as an extension of speaking. And I I do voice lessons over FaceTime, if any, voice lessons and um, acting the song lessons, if anyone is ever interesting, interested. And with my students, we really come from the speaking voice. We come, we mm -hmm. think of, how little kids, I'm pointing to my son who's sleeping right now, how they vocalize with such freedom because there's no restrictions, right? And they can just sing, mom, mom, yelling at the top of their lungs and there's no pain. So I have my students just yell kind of obnoxiously, mom, to, to their mother in the other room, to their mother upstairs in the court, like if you're looking at the corner to an upstairs room, because when you tilt your head back, you have access to mm -hmm. more of your um, your thicker folds for belting. If you, to sing in your head voice, you kind of tilt your head down and then to access mm -hmm. that chest voice, you tilt your head up a little bit. So it's just great to like imagine that your mom is like up there on a hill and you're pissed and you're yelling at her. <laughs> mom! Exactly, you find that freedom. Like it's mm -hmm. so fun to watch my students like, belting something and there's all this restriction and then they yell mom up the hill and it all goes away wow. like it's so natural for all of us to just be like nasty and obnoxious and your voice like goes into perfect belt position so then we just yell that on different pitches higher and higher so i would say like the easiest way to think of me singing at the ballet is that on an e natural i'm going at the bell mom and just like yelling it up the hill and it really just opens the voice up and frees the voice up and it feels like just a slightly a s effort isn't the right word maybe effort just a slightly more effort effortful speaking mm -hmm. not tense not muscled but just um more vibration love that that's Great advice. And so you teach voice lessons. How how would someone get in contact with you if they decide they would love to take lessons with you over FaceTime? Sure. Um, you, I'll just give you my email address, my business email address, <laughs> Mara, M-A-R-A, D for Dobby, Gaines, G-A-I-N-E-S as in Sam, at gmail.com. If you email me there, um, yeah, we could do FaceTime lessons. I, I, I love doing acting, acting monologues, acting the song primarily for audition prep, but then we will just like spot check singing things. I don't typically do full voice lessons because I don't, the piano thing is hard and stuff. It's really like, hard. Yeah, but definitely for like technique things, spot checking, just freeing the voice up. Um, we will do some technique stuff, but then we'll just really hit the storytelling because also I find so so often, if you focus on the storytelling, if you focus on who you're talking to and what you want, so many of that vocal shite goes <laughs> away because you're not thinking, how am I singing? You're thinking, what do I want and how do I get it? And gets you out of your head and yeah. into your heart. Yeah. <laughs> so to speak. Um, all right. Well, I think that There's Taylor has one question oh. that I think you should. Sorry oh. about that. Oh, yes. No, With I did. Probably shows oh, being yeah. more conscious on casting shows and a more inclusive emphasis. What steps can we take at the community level to create more opportunity to include people who would possibly not be involved otherwise in our art form? That's a wonderful question. Um, I don't know if I have a masterful answer for that. Sarah, please feel free to... Let's see here. Let me read it again. Okay. So what steps can we take at the... I mean, 
I know as a cat, when I'm casting shows myself, I'm always just looking at the person as a whole. I'm not looking at any aspect of them. You know, it always for me comes down to, yeah, what is kind of, oh my gosh, how do I, did I, how do I take that back off of there? I don't know yeah. how I do that. Hold on. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, I don't know, for me personally, whenever I'm directing a show and I have people coming through, I'm looking at what what's coming through their heart and soul and, and what they're projecting of themselves on stage, not necessarily. Um, yeah. You know, we've actually just in Oliver, we had a female Dodger that we just cast. And awesome. she's fantastic. Like, who, and she'll who, do it who, next year. She what? I said, she'll get to do it next year. That's right. We have, we have That's right. When this year. is all over. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's all about the storytelling, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. Lions casting, inclusive casting, it. it's all just like who who is telling who is telling the story. Um, and um, in terms of programs, outreach, in addition to picking shows that have more diverse characters available. I mean, I think I think you can pick shows with more diverse characters or just pick a show and then and then just cast the person who's telling the story, right? Um, um in terms of like at the community level, creating opportunity to people who wouldn't be involved otherwise. Um, I, th this has to change. It might have to be Zoom meetings or this kind of thing right now, but I just, we've done some like Shakespeare workshops for kids and we had a Shakespeare workshop set up at our local library that is not happening. But I feel like reaching out side of the theater community to schools and libraries and holding um, fun workshops where you're just like, it's like people think they can't do Shakespeare, but for an hour just, you know, playing Shakespeare games and getting up on your feet and realizing that you can live in this world and lose your inhibitions, reaching out to community groups that way, then might pull them in to spotlight theater company or whatever theater space you might happen to be in. I don't know how that looks in this zoom world. We're still figuring it out. Yeah. Um, but it's fun to see how people are getting creative and, you know, saying like, Hey, Sunday is Shakespeare Sunday. Everyone throw up your favorite Shakespeare speech on online. And it's cool yeah. to see. I, I feel like for introverts who only wanted, who are passionate, but only do things at home, that it's a good time for the introverts to, you know, do something in the privacy of their home and then, and then start reaching out. So it'll be neat to see what comes out of it. And then Vestal says, I've heard of people using Zoom for readers for self tapes. Is there a good Facebook group or other resource to network for that? I have no idea. Does anyone know? Brian. Brian. <laughs> let, us, let us, yeah, start a group, let us know. Um, and I would just say, like, reach out to your friends, your favorite actors, and just, um, and just use use each other. But yeah, if you start a group, let us all know. Maybe that's maybe that's your job, Brian, is to get that going. <laughs> You're the one that is going to create this resource for yeah. everyone. He will be the superstar of Zoom readers. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you guys so much for all yeah. these questions. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us today and good luck with everything. And, you know, we're all you too. praying for Broadway and all the theaters around the world the right theaters, now. Every um, level, right? I feel like Broadway is, will might come back faster than some other things like, you know, so it's all the theaters. Yes. Yeah. Well, thanks again. And give your, your little guy a hug for me. And um, oh, we'll have to do this again soon. <laughs> I would like to say one more thing, which is yeah. what my friend pointed out to me, which is it's so clear how valuable art is right now. Like, obviously, we're watching most of it through our TV and computer screens. But, you know, I kind of forget sometimes, like, all of this content that we're watching, all of these and and all the streaming Netflix and Hulu and everything. It's like that's that's art. That's acting like when yeah. we're stuck at home, what we want to see is creation. So we will get through it and it will keep going in Absolutely. many different forms. Stay yeah. strong, everybody. Yeah.
All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. And this will be available for replay if anybody wants to watch it later. Um, yeah. So take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.